This is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, welcome to worship at Parkway Presbyterian Church in Corpus Christi, uh, Texas. Special welcome to those of you who are uh, watching our live stream this morning. We are glad that you are able to join us and hope that this would be enriching for your spiritual life. And welcome to all of those of you who are here in the sanctuary with us today. Just a couple of uh, things to announce for a while now. We have been announcing the anticipation of having an ice cream social uh, this evening. But the uptick in the number of uh, COVID cases in the community, we have decided that we're probably better off to postpone that. We would also you know, have to serve uh, you know, prepackaged uh, ice cream instead of that homemade thing that we all look forward to and think we're going to have at an ice cream social. So we're going to postpone that for a while, um, but thanks for your interest in that event. Also, just a reminder to the members of the session that our monthly meeting is going to be this Tuesday at uh, 6 o'clock. And again, so we're going to meet in a larger room so we have a little bit better uh, chance to social distance. We will be meeting in, in room E3 in the uh, educational wing rather than in the conference room, but we'll have signs up for you as you come in so you can find your way. So just a reminder, the session meeting on Tuesday. Let's uh, now continue in worship. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Sacred spaces can invite us to imagine God on high. A different sanctuary sings of the glory of creation. In some places, God is an intimate friend. This space affirms the community of believers. No matter the architecture, we unite in saying, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. Spoon! 
Let's pray together the prayer of confession. Loving God, you have set within the human heart a desire to draw near and know you. We draw closer to the source of love, compassion, and mercy, yet our lives are often marked by the very opposite traits, hatred, judgment, and retribution. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put your right way within us. Let our lives reflect the God we love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Charlotte, would you like to come up this morning? So I've got to let me find this place here in the Bible. We're going to read to, in just a second Psalm 84. Okay. And do, 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 do. you can read this for us, just that first line. Dwelling. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. And the, the hymn that we just sang, How Lovely, Lord, How Lovely, is based on Psalm 84. And they, the, you know, the psalms were originally probably sung. Uh, we don't know what tunes they were sung to. Uh, a lot of composers have taken psalms like this and put them to music as best they can, but we don't know what it originally sounded like. But I can imagine this as being about the beautiful uh, temple that Solomon built in Jerusalem, where the people went to gather for worship. And we've got a beautiful room here in which we get to worship too. And I was thinking, at St. James School, do you guys have chapel there? Okay. And I, do you do chapel in their big sanctuary, or do they have a smaller chapel? You go in the big sanctuary. So I've, I'm kind of familiar with that room. I wouldn't have been as familiar with, the, with, their, um, with their chapel. But that sanctuary, and they've got right banners, right, that hang along the side. They're really, really pretty to look at. And then your eyes all look up towards the front, and they've got a, a like, there they would call it the altar. There at the top and above the altar, there's a pretty stained glass window, right? This room looks really different from that one, doesn't it? Right, because first of all, you know we are we aren't all sitting on the same level. These these pews are tiered, so that we kind of look out across at one another. Let's see, we don't have banners, but we have these copper reliefs, copper pieces that are above the six sections that are just oh so gorgeous and pretty, and distinctive, and uh, we um, at that there they have. A pulpit, and the pulpit is lifted up just like this one is, except they've got like a pulpit on one side and a lectern on the other. And if I remember right, is the, the one with the Bible, and it's, it's like shaped like an eagle. Do I remember that right? That happens at some Episcopal churches. Yeah, you look on Thursday and see. If it looks like a bird, it's an eagle, <laughs> not a pigeon or something. Yeah, so... These beautiful spaces, and one of the things that I like when I go to different churches is to look around and to see how the church shape and how it makes you think particular things about God. And one of the things I love about this sanctuary is that what you think about God is you think about God in the faces of all these people. Because that's the way your eyes are directed, are right to look at the other people. So this is a very sense of God is with us in community. It says that we are here for one another and we help one another. And I love that uh, about this particular space where we worship. <laughs> 
So let's uh, have a word of prayer to thank God for spaces in which we get to uh, gather together for worship. Oh God, your dwelling place is lovely, and there are so many lovely sanctuaries and buildings set apart for worship to you. Each one of them unique, and each one of them able to inspire your people. And we give you thanks for those who gave the thoughtfulness to the creation of this sacred space and make it useful to us through all these years. Amen. Thanks, Charlotte. You can head back to your seat. So our uh, reading from Scripture today is a uh, reading from the, the 84th Psalm. Charlotte already read the first line for us, but we'll do it again. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed, it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in those who heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. In writing out the title for this sermon, How Lovely is Thy Dwelling Place, O Lord of Hosts, almost feels like you need to cue up the choir to sing the beautiful anthem by that same title written by Johannes Brahms, a part of his German Requiem. It is one of the uh, essential pieces of large choirs, large choirs. Our choir could probably not do justice to the piece just because you need so many voices for it to work. The, the standard division in an anthem are sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses. And in Brahms' uh, Requiem, in, in How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place, most of those parts are subdivided as well. So you've got first and second sopranos, first and second altos, so on and so forth. So you really end up with eight vocal parts. And you probably need five voices on each of those parts to really do the piece justice. But it is absolutely magnificent. Iris sang for us another version, another setting of the 84th Psalm. This one, how lovely, Lord, how lovely is thy dwelling place. My soul longs and thirsts to feast upon your face. Written by Arlo Duba and Hal Hobson, a couple of fine Presbyterians, both of them, I think, in their 90s now. Uh, Arlo Duba was the professor of worship at Dubuque Theological Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa. Hal Hobson uh, retired now and a full-time composer, but for many years he was the director of music at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Nashville, Tennessee. And the wonder of their piece is the sense of intimacy with God. How lovely, Lord, how lovely is, is perfect for a single voice to sing, whereas how lovely is thy dwelling place needs a 40-voice choir because it is about that intimacy. Uh, even the sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest where she can lay her young in thy place. Sometimes our souls need Brahms, and sometimes our souls need Duba and Hobson, sense of grandeur of God, sense of intimacy with God. 
And I've wondered about this psalm. There is absolutely no way of knowing whether or not the psalm was written at the time of the dedication of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Let, let me just do a little history for you because the dwelling place of God has been with the people of Israel. And, and when Moses received the tablets of the Ten Commandments, this covenant with God, they needed to have a place to store the tablets and to be able to move them. And so they built a box. The box was called the Ark, which is another word for box, Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant is where they stored the tablets. And the Ark of the Covenant had poles attached to the sides of it so that the box could be picked up and carried from place to place. And one of the places it went was it went with the army into battle so that God could be there as the army went into battle. And the top of the box, uh, two cherubim, which I never have exactly known what a cherubim looks like, but they're lovely, I'm sure. And the two cherubim sit on the end of the top of the box, and then the middle is open, and that is the throne of God. That is the place where God can sit on the Ark of the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant is moved from place to place when the army goes into battle. And as happens when armies go into battle, sometimes things change hands that you don't want to change hands. And every once in a while, Israel loses the Ark of the Covenant, and then they have to go into another battle and have another war so they can get the Ark of the Covenant back. The main place where the Ark of the Covenant resides through the period up until the kings is in the town of Shiloh. Shiloh is an important place in the history of Israel because that is where the tribal confederation really gets established. So there are 12 tribes of Israel. Joshua brings all of the leaders of those 12 tribes together to Shiloh and they divide out the land. So this tribe will have this section of land, and this tribe will have that section of land. And that, that division of the land happens at Shiloh. And of course, at that point in time, the Ark of the Covenant is there at Shiloh, because that is where God is making this arrangement for the land. The, the Ark also stays within a tent, and it's called the Tent of Meeting. So that as the ark is moved, usually the tent goes with it, and the tent is set up to keep the ark out of the weather and so that the priests can go in for the celebration of, of the religious events. Now along comes the time for King David. And David does what is just absolutely pure genius as he decides that both the king and the ark of the covenant, God, should be in the same place at the same time. And so he establishes Jerusalem to be his home, and he moves the Ark of the Covenant in the Tent of Meeting to Jerusalem. He prays to God and says, should I build a house for me, or should I build a house for you? And through the prophet Nathan, the answer comes back to David, where God says, I have not lived in a house since I brought the people of Israel up out of slavery in Egypt. I have always lived in a tent, and I am just fine there. You build a house for you. When you die, one of your ancestors will build a house for me. And that comes then to David's son, King Solomon. And during this time uh, in the common lectionary, we have, during the summer months here, it's been stories about David and now stories about Solomon. And with King Solomon, we think about you know, three real big things. First of all, his wisdom, then an account of his wisdom in that story about the two women who bring one child to him to decide whose child it is, and then the story of the building and the dedication of the temple. The story of the building of the temple is uh, in 1 Kings uh, 6 and 7. The dedication takes two chapters as well, chapters 8 and 9. Never seen the temple. I've only seen pictures of artists' renditions of what it might have looked like. But I've been in a lot of churches, and I'm fascinated with church architecture. And it must be, for an architect, one of those, wow, what a big canvas to paint on, to somebody to come to you and commission you to design a church and say, design a space worthy 
of divine worship. What, what an open canvas that would be. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do with the roof line? Lots of churches have that very steep roof so that you really have in the sanctuary a sense of the vertical dimension of faith, that you are looking up to the heavens, looking up to God on high. But then there's also the biblical notion that what separates heaven from earth is a dome in the sky. And so you might do a roof that was dome-shaped, as a reminder that that's the biblical image of what separates heaven and the earth. In this room, one of the things is, is there is very little here to draw your eye vertically to that vertical sense of faith, and there is everything in here to draw your eye horizontally to that faith that is engagement with one another and the importance of the community to one another. Uh, Trinity Presbyterian Church in Nashville, where I served in the design of that sanctuary, they wanted natural light, lots of natural light. And so in the front and the back, there are these giant windows with no stained glass in the middle, just to allow the natural light into the room. And yet stained glass windows can be so attractive. I think one of the prettiest stained glass windows I have seen is just around the corner over at St. Luke's Methodist Church beautiful stained glass window in the front of, of their nave. And then there's, where do you put the musicians for worship? So Charlotte goes over to James School and at Church of the Good Shepherd, very traditional English sort of uh, architecture where the choir sits along the sides of the nave, the choir members looking at each other but perpendicular to the congregation. Members of the congregation sitting out their eyes directed towards the altar, not to the musicians. And the church in which I grew up, that was very that was, that was designed as well until sometime in the 1960s when they decided to swing those pews uh, for the choir sideways. So the choir was facing the congregation, the congregation was, was facing the choir because there's a desire, of course, to see the musicians. But at the same time, in the 1960s, there was a big movement to put the musicians in the balcony. And choirs and organs and everything went into balconies because the musicians were to be out of sight. And it was great for sound. The sound was absolutely marvelous, but the people couldn't see the musicians. So what did they do? They all turned around. <laughs> so the whole idea of getting the musicians out of sight was uh, lost on the people who wanted to see the musicians, so they turned around to see them. Now, we put musicians up center stage. Some of the newer churches where they have a praise band will have all kinds of space set out up in front for the musicians and the work that they do because they have become so focal to our worship service. that We look and we, we want the musicians up front. And then, of course, in the Presbyterian tradition, there's the, the question about where do you place the pulpit? In the Presbyterian tradition... The preaching of the word was kind of the central act of worship. And so where the pulpit was was important in, in many old churches. It was, of course, elevated. And part of the reason for that, because the, the congregation was not, the congregation all sat at one level. And so by elevating the pulpit, you had sight lines, even if you were in the back. And the other thing was for sound, that before amplification, somebody that was higher up could project sound out better. So Parkway kind of follows that in that the pulpit is elevated. But I come from an era, and I, I don't think it was just trendy, but Margo, it may have just been trendy. Um, when preachers decided we didn't like the, this hierarchy of preacher congregation, and we wanted to level out that hierarchy, and so we started getting out of pulpits to stand down at the level of the congregation. And yeah, it was probably trendy, but I was a part of it, so here I, here I am in, instead of up there. And I never will forget the very first uh, sermon that I uh, preached, not the senior sermon at my home church, but I was in seminary and the uh, bulletin board had you know, churches looking for 
preachers for particular days, and so I volunteered my services to the folks at First Presbyterian Church, Chinoa, Illinois. Uh, and First Presbyterian Church, Chinoa, Illinois, very typical uh, front of the church, communion table, choir, uh, pulpit on one side, lectern on the other. The unusual thing was it's the only pulpit I have ever stepped down into. Only one ever. And I don't know the message that the architect had in mind, but I know the message that I got that morning. Don't think too much of yourself, Sonny. <laughs> How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. In all of those varieties of sanctuaries uh, we have all experienced, my soul longs, yea, it faints for the courts of the Lord. And sometimes we go into the sanctuary and we need Brahms. We need the 40-voice choir because life has gotten chaotic and the centrifugal force is just throwing stuff every which way and we need the God who can bring order out of chaos. We need the God who can take all of the swirling stuff of life and bring it back into an order that we can deal with. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. And there are times when we need Hobson and Duba. We need the intimacy of God. Things perhaps are a little out of control for ourselves and the touchstones of faith that made sense and brought us a sense of peace aren't working. At that point in time, we don't need the God, the great I am. We need the God who provides a place for the sparrow and the swallow to build her nests. How lovely, Lord, how lovely is thy dwelling place. My soul longs and thirsts to look upon your face. Amen.
appreciate the good times be Let's affirm our faith together by reading a declaration of faith. God has not taken his people out of the world, but has sent them into the world to worship him there and serve all humankind. We worship God in the world by standing before the Lord in behalf of all people. Our cries for help and our songs of praise are never for ourselves alone. Worship is no retreat from the world. It is part of our mission. Let us turn together to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you with hearts full of praise and prayers. We praise you for the beauty that we see all around us in the birds of the air, the flowers of the field, the faces in the crowd. We are full of prayers for the chaos that we see around us, in the illness of our friends, the discord in politics, and a regime change in Afghanistan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We love the stories of Jesus healing those bound to ill health. We see in Jesus your healing powers. We also know that your work is done on earth through ordinary people. So we pray this morning for all the hospital and health care workers on the front lines of the current pandemic. Give them the strength they need for each day and the rest they need from the overwhelming stress. We are grateful for scientists and researchers who have developed a vaccine and for those who have rolled up the proverbial sleeve for that ounce of prevention. We're in distress that the population most affected has been shifting from the elderly now to the young. So give your wisdom to those who affect public policy and schools and businesses in our churches to balance the concerns between public health and public activity. Lord God, of all the lands, we watch the news from Afghanistan with full and heavy hearts. Pundits will speculate for years about how this tragedy came about and how it could have been avoided, but no one can undo the past. We can pray for peace. We can pray for the women and their place in Afghan society. We can pray for the children, that they might have a hope for the future. And we can pray that the way forward relies less on the power of violence and more on the power of mutual benefit. Lord God, our prayer list is long and we are prone to overlook the needs of those closest to us. But in these moments of silence, Lord, hear the prayer concerns that we carry.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And attend to all of our prayers as we join in the prayer Jesus taught to his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I want to thank all of you for your generosity to the mission and ministry of Parkway Presbyterian Church. If you are here in the sanctuary, you can make a gift to the church. Uh, please use the offering baskets that are on either side of the door as you exit the sanctuary. If you're watching us on our live stream, we also appreciate any donations you would make. You can either use our church website or if you have a smartphone, the QR code that you will see on the screen, that'll take you to our giving portal. Uh, my word of thankfulness today is that Michelle Clements and Ann Mosman have safely returned from their mission trip to Guatemala. Uh, the trip was 10 days long and included painting on the uh, security wall at the Hope Academy that Parkway paid for. Uh, they also helped with uh, organize a food distribution for the people of the village of Aguacate. Uh, also maintenance projects around the children's home, the Hogar Miguel Magon, as well as helping the students with their schoolwork and just having time to give kids hugs. Uh, next Sunday, uh, Anne and Michelle will be preaching the sermon, uh, bringing you the good news about the work that they saw and did while they were in Guatemala. Well, let's pray together. Gracious God, your goodness comes to us in a myriad of ways each day. We are thankful for the mission work in which we engage in Guatemala. We pray for Karen and Esuardo and for all of the children at Hogar Miguel Magón. We pray for the girls and their teachers at Hope Academy. We pray for the people of Aguacate and the meeting of their basic needs in this time that is so desperate for so many. By your grace, we give you thanks that we are fortunate enough to be able to give in return. Bless and multiply our gifts by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts. Blessings of God for this holy space in which we get to worship Thanks for the blessings of God for one another with whom we worship. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>